Hi, and welcome back to the second hour of Vocal Point on AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Uh, Bobby, if you're still listening, just want to speak a couple of words to you. I've been yeah, getting uh, kind of drilled by um, my various program observers. That was a little hard on you. And, you know, if, uh, other listeners want to call in. And, and if you agree with I was too hard on, on, on Bobby, wasn't kind to him, let me know, 888-589-8840. Or if you think um, he needed uh, kind of a tough love approach, uh, let me know that too, 888 888- Five eight nine eight eight four zero. Now, I'll tell you what was going on there with with Bobby, and uh, I'm perfectly willing to admit I might have been too uh, forceful or too aggressive with him. But what Bobby was doing there in that conversation is he was trying to avoid answering the question, and that's why I wasn't going to let him skate on the question. Uh, when I asked him about what this guy said, what part about your children belong to us do you not understand, he wanted to talk about the fact it's not about this, it's it's about money, it's not about that. Well, no, wait a minute. I'm not going to let you dodge the question by making it about money because it's not about money. It's about who the kids belong to. So we chat for a little bit, and then he wants to say, well, that guy doesn't have any power. Well, uh, I'm not going to let him dodge doing that. Again, that's not the point, Bobby. He's a liberal who believes that children belong to, to the state. So uh, anyway, I just was not going to let Bobby. I appreciate him calling Bobby. If you think I was too hard on you, I'm willing to admit that that may be possible. Maybe our listeners will kind of weigh in uh, on that. Uh, but Bobby, I just was not going to let you. I think you need a little tough love there, buddy. And maybe my love was a little too tough. I'm glad to have our listening audience correct me on that, but you need a little tough love there, buddy, because you were trying to skate on what was a simple and straightforward and honest question, and it was my responsibility to kind of hold you to account for uh, facing the truth. So anyway, 888-589-8840 is the uh, number to call, and we'll be glad to take your observations on that and uh, any other of the topics that we have been talking about in uh, in this hour. Let's grab uh, clip number four, if we can, Rob. This is uh, David Gregory. Uh, and, you know, we've, been, we, we've talked repeatedly about the condition of our economy. And the reality is you have 92 million people that are working-age Americans that are not working. The labor force participation rate, the, the percentage of the American population that's actually holding down jobs, actually working, is at the lowest level it's been uh, since Jimmy Carter, uh, the the real unemployment rate is probably between 11 and 12 percent. That's the state of our economy. And yet President Obama has been out there relentlessly trying to convince people that we're in a, this wonderful recovery. We're having this great rebound. And David Gregory, who is apparently just not um, d- just not dealing with the facts, kind of like our last caller, not looking at the facts and being willing to uh, admit them. Uh, He has uh, Sean McDonough on his show, Meet the Press, on Sunday. Sean McDonough, chief of staff for President Obama. And David Gregory has bought the complete line that we're in this marvelous recovery. And it's not even the question here. It's not even the answer that's important. It's the question that David Gregory asks. Let's listen. The issue of the economy is a big one. Do you ever wonder why the president doesn't get more credit for an economy that is rebounding? Is there, what's the disconnect? (laughs) Why doesn't the president get more credit for a rebound for an economy that is uh, rebounding? One other uh, clip, Rob, let's play clip number five. This may explain the reason why... uh, President Obama has become increasingly lawless and dictatorial in his second term. Chuck Todd explaining why. Let's listen. So, uh, you know, at some point you do figure the politics is going to sort of impact where the the president comes down here. But on the big picture legacy thing, you know, the other part that, that the president was elected on was changing politics as we know it in this town. And that's what sort of has stunned me from the David Remnick interview to the State of the Union itself, which is all painted pictures of, you know what, He's resigned to the, constra- the, to the constraints of the office and the constraints of the politics of this town. He's given up on trying to break the polarization uh, addiction that this town has. Um, some will say he added to it, but 
uh, he's given that up. And to me, that's, the, that's going to be something that I think historians are going to be writing about as the great disappointment of the Obama. But I think so I think Chuck Todd said, look, President Obama has given up doing anything about the polarization. He doesn't think he can change D.C. He doesn't think there's any way to overcome it. And so that, I think, that's Chuck Todd's explanation of why President Obama is just now governing by diktat, governing by dictates, governing by mandates, governing by executive orders, governing uh, apart from the Constitution, apart from Congress, because he has just given up uh, trying to break through this polarization, getting any sort of, any sort of uh, legislation through Congress, so he's just going to do it on his own. Well, let's grab a phone call. Let's go to Bill in Billington, West Virginia. Bill, you had a comment about my interaction with Bobby. Talk to me. Yes, I did, Brian. Uh, no, you were not too hard on him. I, I believe if, if I were on the phone with him or that other fellow was on prior to him were on the phone with him, we would have heard a little bit more even. <laughs> so no, you were not too hard on him. And that's the problem we got today is these people, they think, well, you know what, they don't, they don't pay any attention to what's going on, and then they hear something and they call in and make those ridiculous comments. I had the feeling when you were talking to him, Barack Obama all over again when he would not answer the question. Well, you know, it was, it was, it was like listening to that Bill O'Reilly, Barack Obama interview, wasn't it, where Bill O'Reilly would ask him a question and Barack Obama would just refuse to answer it. And, you know, when you're dealing with the president of the United States, you've got to have respect for the office, and so there's a point at which... Uh, you know, you, you, you recognize you're not going to get an answer and he's going to be evasive and there's not really anything you're going to do about it. You only got 10 minutes. You got to move on to other stuff. But it was, kind of, you know, it was kind of similar. It's a little, you know, it, it's a little frustrating trying to get somebody to admit something. It's so straightforward. All right, Bill, listen, I appreciate the call. Let's go to Dan, Dallas, Texas. Dan, I think you uh, got an observation about my interaction with Bobby. Talk to me. Dan, are you with me? Okay, we lost uh, Dan. All right, let's grab uh, Tom in Marion, Ohio. Uh, Tom, welcome. Got about another minute left. What's on your mind? We got Tom in Marion? Yes. Okay, I guess we... Uh, okay, Tom, can you hear me? Yes, sir, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. My bad. I think I had my uh, volume turned down too low. Go, go ahead. Well, I don't think he was too hard on him. Um if we had somebody that would speak out like that a little more often, maybe things would be a little different. Um, I, I had a comment. Um, I think that it all has to start at the pulpit, and I think that uh, the Christians that are listening needs to pray for this country, and and the ones that don't want to lead the country the way they should, I think that we shouldn't vote for those people. Mm -hmm. I think we should get them out. Yeah. And my advice is that just everybody should pray and leave it in God's hands because the, the right thing will happen then. Yeah. All right, Tom, listen, I appreciate that. And, you know, the, the pulpits were critical, and the pulpits are still critical to any kind of moral renewal, spiritual renewal in America, because where are people going to hear about values? Where are they going to hear about truth? Where are they going to hear about moral standards? The primary place they are going to hear about that and need to hear about that, Tom is exactly right, is from the pulpits of America. That's how we become a nation that has a shared set of moral values and an understanding of truth. Back in two.